I'll begin by introducing our first speaker this afternoon, uh, Sasha Rasmussen, who is a Skaludi Fellow at the University of Oxford. Uh, Sasha is a cultural historian working at the intersection of gender and sensory histories, and is currently in the final year of her DPhil, Sensory History and Modern Women in Paris and St. Petersburg, 1900-1913 at, uh, at Oxford. Um, she's beginning with an analysis of the publication L'Hubital Codiciste, the amateur codiciste, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, Sasha, you can tell me if I haven't. Um, and this paper this afternoon will explore how women embraced photography in pre-revolutionary Russia as one of a range of visual technologies through which the female gaze may be captured and curated, transforming the act of looking into an imaginative process. So to give her paper, Lorgnettes and Lupitel Kodakist, Women Looking in Late Imperial Russia, I'll hand over now to Sasha, thank you. Oh, thanks so much. Um, let me just. Right, that should be up now. Um, I hope you can all see the slides and hear me speak. Could someone just give me a nod if that's all good? Great, thanks guys. Um, okay. Right, so thank you to Philip for the introduction and thank you to all of you for coming along this afternoon. Um, the thoughts I'm presenting today are still quite fresh, and so I'm really excited to hear your feedback on these ideas. Um, as Philip said, my research more broadly sits at the intersection of gender and sensory histories and focuses on the lives of women in Paris and St. Petersburg in the early 20th century. I'm interested in how sensory experience was gendered, and my thesis incorporates topics such as fashion, consumer culture, musical encounters, photography, bathing, perfume, and cosmetics. The material I'll be discussing today is drawn from my third chapter, which explores the female gaze. We know how women in the early 20th century looked, that is, how they managed their appearance and presented themselves to the gaze of others. In this chapter, I am interested in how women looked in the sense of how they engaged with cultures of visuality. This is an intellectual pivot also visible in recent scholarship, which has recognized that women were not only objects of the male gaze, but also agents in their own right. However, what I found in a lot of otherwise really excellent literature about urban spectatorship in this period is that it either assumes the observer is male by default or treats a spectating audience as a homogenous unit. So I set out to find examples of women looking at things as women, which turned out to be quite difficult to pin down given that most women probably looked at things for upwards of 12 hours a day. So instead, I turned my attention to instances where looking is a focused and deliberate activity. And these seem to crystallize around material culture in some really interesting ways. Mirrors, lorgnettes, theater binoculars, the illustrated women's press, and increasingly paraphernalia associated with photography and film. I tend to think of these objects as technologies of the gaze because they allow women in some way to modify, enhance, capture, or emphasize their gaze or mode of looking. Women's enthusiasm for optical devices and visual media, I think, suggests a desire to immortalize or preserve their own particular perspective. What I'd like to do in this paper is first to take a real whirlwind tour of the scholarly landscape surrounding visual culture in the fin de siècle and the accompanying, the accompanying anxiety about the potential dangers of looking. Then I want to offer two examples of women looking in St. Petersburg in the first decade of the 20th century. First, Vera Nijersheva's pamphlet, Nevsky Prospekt, which treats the subject of urban prostitution. And second, a commercial publication for amateur photographers, Jubitel Kodekist. In both contemporary experience and subsequent scholarship, visuality, urbanization, public space, and modernity are all tangled up together in ways that I unfortunately don't have time to fully unpack here although I've signaled a few works on the slide which have really influenced my thinking on these, on these questions. There's a considerable body of literature which elaborates on the role of the modern city as a locus of display and voyeurism. The work of Walter Benjamin has been particularly influential in this respect. His ideas around urban architecture, display and commodity fetishism revolve around vision as a kind of leitmotif of modernity. More recently, the work of Vanessa Schwartz has picked up on the predominance of visuality in mass urban entertainment. In her book, Spectacular Realities, she considers the boulevard, the wax museum, 
and even the Paris morgue as expressions of a rapidly evolving visual culture. Basically, there was so much looking going on in the city that it was recast as a quintessentially modern activity. Many of these wider European trends also manifested in the Russian Empire, albeit a little bit later than in Western Europe. The city of St. Petersburg had swelled to a population of 2 million by 1912, many of whom were not strictly middle class, but of middling sorts, with sufficient time and money to engage in consumption and leisure activities. As Louise McReynolds has shown, Russians enjoyed, Russians enjoyed many of the same forms of mass entertainment, which were predicated on looking. Theater, illustrated publications, postcards, photography, and film were all popular pastimes amongst all genders. Surrounded by its visual paraphernalia, cosmopolitan Russians were in no doubt that they, like their European counterparts, were experiencing at least the optics of modernity. The visibility of the modern city was a mixed blessing for many women. On the one hand, urban life promised opportunities for education, employment, and personal freedom, but on the other, the city remained a judgmental and hostile place for the woman alone. Women were doubtlessly already aware of the dangers of being looked at and were expected to walk a fine line between fashionable display and attracting unwelcome attention. Seeing and being seen were the inevitable results of moving through the city, bringing danger and pleasure in potentially equal measures. The perceived threat of the city was also closely tied to the corrupting effects of looking and visuality. Throughout the 19th century, there were questions about the appropriateness of looking for women, and these had occupied conservative commentators. Concerns that women might be seduced by flashy displays of luxury goods, perverted by sexually explicit material, or otherwise overwhelmed by the effects of visual exposure were common. Yet as Jan Matlock noted in her discussion of censorship, in the first decades of the 19th century, women have a curious way of turning up whenever there is a question of looking in some new way. Depictions of new visual technology exploited female fascinations with the powers of looking. I want to argue that the same was true in the first decade of the 20th century as new technologies and modes of looking were popularized amongst women and that women took to these ways of seeing with surprising confidence and enthusiasm. So to the first of my examples. In 1906, a pamphlet entitled Nevsky Prospekt was published detailing sex trade, which took place amongst the hustle and bustle of the city's main thoroughfare. Its author was Vera Ivanovna Nudyshiva, who had previously written on questions relating to women, morality, and the family. I first encountered this source in Mark Steinberg's Petersburg Femme du Siècle, in which he refers to Nudyshiva quite casually as an urban explorer. This really struck me, given the heated scholarly debate around even the possibility of a female flaneuse in the Parisian context. And crucially, from my perspective, Nudyshiva's account is interesting because it is centered on the female gaze. Besides her own authorial perspective, women in their eyes are everywhere. And when men do appear, they either do not see or see only superficially. The text of the pamphlet is richly evocative and is permeated with visual references on multiple levels. Firstly, and most straightforwardly, there is the visual spectacle of Nevsky Prospect itself, which twinkles in the early evening, its wares illuminated by electric light. Nijesheva describes the scene and the effect the overwhelming visual spectacle has on women in particular. She says, a warm summer evening, Nevsky is flooded with electricity and is teeming with members of the public. Mirrored shop windows sparkle with gold, silver, diamonds, dazzle with living and artificial flowers. Silk, velvet, lace, thousands of different luxuries strike the eyes of passers-by. Women of all kinds flock from all over to the splendor and luxury, like moths to a flame. Colors and textures are offered up to the eye. Merchandise is freely displayed, but separated from the viewer by panes of glass, eliminating all of the senses except for sight. The reader experiences the visual onslaught of Nevsky Prospect vicariously through Nijesheva's account, although if they were Petersburg locals, they could hardly have avoided a first-hand knowledge of the sites she described. Secondly, there are the people, mostly women, who Nijesheva sees walking on the boulevard, whether they are there for work or leisure. 
To a certain extent, like the glimmering shop windows, these women are part of the urban scenery and provide the backdrop to Nijesheva's narrative. But they are also unlike the infrastructure in that when Nijesheva looks, these women can look back. The result is a kind of telescoping of the female gaze. A woman watches women watching men. And Nijesheva pays consistent attention to women's eyes, although often a stereotypical mark is either innocence or corruption. Clara, a seasoned sex worker known throughout Petersburg, is described in great detail. Her burning black eyes are heavily made up. Vigilantly, with restless eyes, this nocturnal predator stares at passing men, and throwing provocative looks to left and right, she glides through the crowd. Clara's furtive and darting gaze is one of the features which most clearly identifies her as a prostitute, as is the brazen way she makes eye contact with potential clients. Nijesheva uses similar tropes and strong contrast to describe pairs of younger girls she encounters on her route along the boulevard. One of the pair is always pretty, precocious and savvy, dark eyed, her gaze shifts to left and right. Even as she looks pityingly at her friend, she still manages to cast a flirtatious glance at a passing student. The other girl is reluctant, unhappy and modest with the downcast gaze and tearful eyes. Their mode of looking is meant as a clear marker of their moral state. In addition to modest and immoral women, Nijesheva describes a third group of people on Nevsky Prospect, men. An officer strolls casually past his discarded lover, quote, head proudly raised, not even looking at she who had given him everything she had, body and soul. Another cynical prostitute is overheard to exclaim, quote, after all, men are idiots, and she uses the word duraki. Um, she continues, they don't see what's in your soul. They only look at how you're dressed. Having paused to catch her breath, Nijesheva is approached by a dandy who asks to accompany her, seemingly having mistaken or misseen her for a prostitute. The visual cues which are so obvious to Nijesheva in her observations of other women are apparently invisible to this man who assumes that any woman alone must be sexually available. On Nijesheva's Nevsky Prospect, men's vision is absent, unreliable or obscured, turning the trope of the flaneur on its head. Only the women see things for what they are. Sorry, I'm just having a little moment. To Nijesheva, a woman's bold and mobile gaze is indicative of moral corruption. Yet she does not acknowledge the tension between this judgment and her own piercing observations. This is perhaps related, I'm sorry, this is not working for me at the moment. This is perhaps related to the idea of fixity. While the gaze of the prostitute is rapid and shifting, Nijesheva's is the steady gaze of the impartial observer. Nijesheva's own visual authority is the third and perhaps the most important way in which vision is represented in her text. Here again, she resembles the flaneur in that she does not waver in her entitlement to look and observe. She emphasizes her own position as narrator and voyeur through frequent use of the first person and by, directly and by directly addressing the reader, encouraging them to continue with her along Nevsky Prospect, to look over there, she says, as though literally accompanying them down a footpath, or more metaphorically, to see in the imperative, the plight of women. I'm sorry, my notes keep changing page without my permission. Sorry, I'm just having a small technical hiccup. I will be right back where we were in just a minute. Um, so she uses the, the verbs to see in the imperative. She says, the, um, the plight of women. 
And I think this last example is especially significant because she is appealing directly to the female readers of her pamphlet in the, in the first person plural. She says, see what is done to us. Vision therefore plays a key role in her moral argument, recalling the, rela recalling the relationship and rationalist discourse between sight and veracity, where seeing is believing. So to move on to Lubitel Kodekist. While following the trail of visual technologies, I stumbled upon this journal in the Russian archives. Lubitel Kodekist, or the Amateur Kodekist, which is subtitled, An Illustrative Review of Interest to Every Photography Enthusiast. The journal was published in St. Petersburg between 1908 and 1916 by Alexandra Fyodorovna Lore. In total, 38 issues of Lubitel Kodekist were published at irregular intervals and were distributed in shops and chemists which sold photographic supplies without subscriptions and apparently free of charge. The content of the magazine differentiates it from other photographic publications of the time. Each issue was only around eight pages long and its tone strikes a balance between the informative and the familiar, combining technical tips with artistic advice and pra practical suggestions. In contrast, the journals of contemporary men's photography clubs were overwhelmingly dry, containing scientific and technical explanations with few published images. However, the commercial purpose of Lubitel Kodekist to advertise Kodak pro products served as an incentive to tap into the consumer power of middle and upper class women. Over the course of its publication, the magazine gradually increased the proportion of its content that was either implicitly or explicitly directed at female photographers up until 1914, when there was a sudden but unsurprising shift towards portable cameras and photography skills for soldiers. An awareness of women as consumers was evident in the advertisements, images and articles of Lubitel Kodekist, and the journal appealed to ideas of independence and personal ownership when promoting photography as part of the lifestyle of the modern woman. One of the most straightforward attempts to sell photography to female readers was through advertisements aimed at women. So for example, this advertisement for a lady's camera bag, which com combines fashionability with practicality. The vision of the woman photographer conjured by this text is very impressive. Elegant and unencumbered by bulky equipment, she might speedily pull her camera from her stylish bag to capture a snapshot. There is also a sense of self-sufficiency. The bag allows the woman to have everything she might need at her disposal, including spare film and miscellaneous non-photographic objects and she does not require any assistance to carry her equipment. The images published in Lubitel Kodekist showed women photographers as competent and self-reliant. The journal regularly featured photographs of women using cameras or developing film, either alone or with a female companion. These images were often placed alongside a text which emphasized the simplicity of Kodak products, stressing that they were compact and easy to use, increasing accessibility to female readership. One such advertisement for an automated Kodak film tank, which allowed users to develop film without the need for a darkroom, was situated below this image of two women in a sideways embrace, examining a roll of developed film together. The women's hair is tied back, their forearms are exposed, and they stand in what looks like a kitchen. It is clear that they themselves have developed these photographs and that they are delighted with the results. Another roll of film, a wooden, the wooden box of the tank and a cardboard container bearing the mark Kodak are all visible in the background. Similarly, these two images accompanied an article on the benefits of Kodak photography, which explained how the Kodak process freed practitioners from unpredictable results. Throughout the text, the word independence is used repeatedly and even bolded in some instances. The concluding paragraph of the article begins, independence is precisely what the modern person aspires to. When read alongside these images of young women developing photographs, which they presumably capture themselves, the female photographer is cast in this context as the quintessential modern person. She's freed from the tedium of the dark room and from the irregularities of natural light when developing her photographs. The way that Kodak frames this product also locates photography firmly in the domestic 
and therefore feminine space. The text insists that, quote, the difficulty and inconvenience of the darkroom have been eliminated. One could, for this reason, call the Kodak method the salon method. Kodak actively sought to cast photography as a respectable and accessible hobby for the woman of means, and one which she could accomplish unaided. This is, I think it's interesting that when mixed, mixed gender pairs are shown in the illustrations of Lupita Kodakist, it is often the woman who claims ownership over the camera and its visual products. A woman on the cover of issue 34 wields her camera while standing behind a railing with a male companion. In issue 14, a woman shows a photo album to a man in evening dress. The caption of the photo makes it clear that the photographs were taken with her camera. It says, Yeya Aparatum. Photography was further situated within the domestic setting by the prevalence of children throughout the pages of Libita Kodakist. Articles on how best to photograph children or on the benefits of teaching children to take photographs themselves with lightweight and inexpensive cameras appeared frequently in the journal. While men too may have been interested in capturing images of family life, the journal's editors likely ascribed an interest in children to women, given contemporary attitudes towards motherhood and distribution of care and leisure time across the nuclear family. Correspondingly, many of the domestic scenes photographed and published in Libita Kodakist featured mostly women. It is worth noting, however, that children of all genders were shown operating a camera, usually to photograph a sibling, and that this was not a hobby restricted to boys. There is also a difficult and more philosophical dimension to these images on this slide, in that we do not know who took them, whether they were sent in by readers or staged especially for the magazine, perhaps not even in Russia. If we imagine they were taken by the children's mother, Again, there is potentially a nice telescoping of the female gaze. A mother photographs her daughter, who in turn photographs her sister posing with a doll. Yet if they were taken by another male figure, perhaps even a stranger, these images might be read as a male intrusion or a voyeuristic perspective on a moment of female intimacy. I'm conscious that this creates uh, an unfortunate tension between the thing that I'm trying to study, which is women looking, and the medium through which and most often have access to that phenomenon, which is through the eyes of men. This is just another lovely example. This is the cover of issue number 22. And it shows a young woman and a girl who are presumably sisters huddled together behind a camera. The elder wears the camera bag over her shoulder, suggesting that she is its owner and demonstrates to the younger how to use the camera. The dynamic between the girls highlights the transfer of knowledge and expertise of photography amongst its female adherents. Mothers might teach their children to take snapshots of their own, or older and more experienced women might help beginners perfect their technique. Finally, the photographs published in Lupita Kodakist demonstrate how the camera could become an extension of the female gaze. A common visual motif in the journal was a woman looking out directly at the viewer, holding a camera which points in the direction of her gaze. This creates a mirroring effect in which the lens matches a woman's line of sight to become a kind of third eye, amplifying the power of her gaze and reminding the person viewing the image that they are the subject of both her vision and of the photograph she might be about to take. These examples show three iterations of this visual trope. A young woman in vaguely nautical dress, an allegory of a classical muse, and an advertisement, the Kodak Stereo Brownie, which proclaimed, quote, Take pictures as your eyes see them with depth, roundness, and correct perspective. The deliberate use of a female model and the phrasing of the text suggests the advertisers believed the promise of verisimilitude and fidelity to actual visual experience would appeal to women buyers. In, but in all of these images, what I find most striking is the self-possession and assuredness of the woman behind the lens. There is no hesitation and no question as to whether she ought to look she looks boldly out at the viewer and is equipped to capture what she sees. A few concluding thoughts on why this matters. Given the weight of rhetoric in the 19th century about the need to protect women from certain sites, to shield or avert their gaze, and to limit women's access to certain locations or genres of spectacle, when I first began to delve into this topic, I expected to find women peeking tentatively out 
from behind heavy curtains. Instead, I found women engaged in forms of confident, even ostentatious looking in new contexts and with new optical tools. Besides the examples given here of Nudyashova's boulevard spectatorship and the photographic skills of the young women in Lubitilko de Kist, women brandished lorgnettes and binoculars at the theater, decked their homes with multiple angle mirrors, curated photo albums of their families and attended the cinema. What I think we see when we look at women's looking is women appropriating technologies of the gaze for their own purposes and in ways which allow them to create personal narratives and bolster a sense of subjectivity. As such, we should consider women's looking not only as a form of passive entertainment, but as an imaginative process through which women actively sought to shape their own identities and to navigate the urban environment. Thank you. Sasha, thank you very much indeed for that really interesting paper um, and wonderful images. And thank you for making it so rich and enjoyable to look at. Um, okay, we, we now have a chance to ask Sasha some questions about her paper. Um, and if you'd like to add those to the chat, uh, we'll draw on those. Um, so we'll give you sort of uh, 15, 30 seconds to write your questions and you can certainly add them as we go along. We've got about 25 minutes for questions and discussion before we move on to uh, Lucy's paper. Um, while people type their questions, um, Sasha, maybe I could begin by asking you a very um, uh, uh, an opening question, which is you, you talked uh, obviously focusing on on women and looking, um, and there's a relationship there to technologies, technologies of of cameras mm -hmm. and optics and so on. I wondered how this relates and what if there's any connection between other forms of technology, modern technology, and women's participation in it in terms of either travel or, or and, and, and so on and, and, and how that sits with cameras in particular mm -hmm. um, and whether there was how this fits with a broader debate about whether this was acceptable and what the what the the consequences of this um, activity was. Sure um, so it does all streamline together quite nicely um, there is a big debate about photography in its early days as to whether as to whether photography is something scientific and something technical or something artistic. Um, and part of that comes from the fact that, and I nearly put this in the original talk, um, is that technology is gendered masculine. So in the sense of, oh, this is a machine. Men are good with machines. Here, this is a masculine thing. Um, whereas if it's, if it's an artistic thing, if we consider photography as an artistic process of image creation, then women's presence is, is more accepted, I think. Um, or more easily smoothed by their participation in the visual arts. And that has also been problematic, but it was, it was understood that women might paint landscapes and that photography might be, might fall into part of that. There's um, a lot of really interesting amateur photographers who are women over the course of the 19th century when it's still very early, um, who, are, who are creating some very artistic images um, rather than simply technically reproducing something. Um, unfortunately, they fall outside my time period, so I can't get um, too deep into that. Um, second half of your question. Oh, other technologies. Um, so the use of photography is also combined with other technologies. So the most obvious example is the bicycle, um, which was problematic in a number of um, circles and did sort of... <laughs> It wasn't explicitly linked to ideas of feminism, but they, they, for lack of a better word, they're kind of vibing together, um, bicycles and feminism. And something that women would do would be to mount their camera on the front of their bicycle and then go on a day cycling trip. And then they could just hop off and photograph what they saw and then hop back on and carry on on their way. So I think even if, even if these technologies are not filtering into the formal discourse of of women's rights and independence and emancipation, I think they are all sort of sitting together in a cluster, if that makes sense. Does that does that sort of answer your question? Yes, very much so. And I I, I do like that 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 intersection of different technologies working together. It's very interesting. Um, okay, um, Ruth Ruth Harris, would you like to ask your question, please? Sorry about muting. It's always a pain. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Um, what I wanted to ask was about the nature of the comparison. I mean, you started off with Paris, and I'm wondering what it is that the comparison can tell us about these two different societies. I mean, of course, Paris was famous as the capital of looking. I mean, it had the salon, it introduced the restaurant with mirrors in the 18th century. Um, is there something that you want to say more broadly about the nature of looking in these two cultures? Yes, um, so I think a lot of my thesis, the comparison of my thesis has grown out of my feeling that when I read things about Paris, I think to myself, oh, but that's also true of Russia. Um, so as you're absolutely right to say that Paris is sort of the capital of looking in a lot of ways, but I think um, you can also tell that story about St. Petersburg. So the founding of St. Petersburg as a, as a city, it's founded very quickly and the architecture goes up in a very uniform style. And this generates a lot of comments about how St. Petersburg is essentially like a theatrical backdrop. So a lot of these ideas of, oh, modern life is a spectacle which is played out on the stage of the city. I think those all apply. I think those are all very salient for the Petersburg context. Um, I also think that it's, it's worthwhile to look at these new technologies in a different in a different geographical context. We often talk about how Russia doesn't industrialize as fast. We talk about how Russia is, is behind on a lot of these processes which we associate with modernity. And part of what I wanna do in my doctoral project is to argue that culturally and in, in cultural spheres, Russia is keeping pace really well. Um, so I, I would like to suggest that looking is similar across the two, the two cities. I have, I think, found the equivalent, the French equivalent of because I think it's an international publication and I think I've found one of the French copies in the Bibliothèque Nationale, but I am still waiting for them to reproduce it for me. So I can't be quite sure that it is the identical publication, but I'd really like to find the French equivalent and that would give me a straight comparison. Apples and apples, oranges and oranges, which I think would be interesting as well. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, Hubertus, should we go to you next for your question, please? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha, for this amazing talk. It brings, <laughs> brings lots of bells, brings up lots of questions. I'm not going to ask all of them, just a few. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning um, the cinema. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'm thinking of all these films pre-1917, uh, where female agency is actually very prominent, such as The Child of the Big City, for example, where you have the image of the woman standing in front of the shop and looking through this glass, all the, all the luxury items, all of that. Uh, and of course, we know that, uh, especially during the First World War, uh, the majority of uh, cinema audiences were women. And, and I was wondering whether uh, the directors of these films, Yevgeny Bauer and the rest, were actually paying attention to that and applying this kind of special gaze mm. uh, while they were doing their films. And of course, Bauer's wife was also playing in one of the films. I mean, they were talking uh, obviously about the aesthetics of, of, of this. So this is this is one uh, point. The other point was more practical. Uh, Kodak, of course, is a very handy thing if you travel. And of course, Louis McReynolds has also written about tourism. Uh, is the female tourist the person that you're interested in? Are you looking at that part as well? When you, when you showed the picture of uh, the woman standing with this man at the railing, I was actually thinking, is that on a steamboat? Mm. Or are they traveling somewhere? So in other words, where does that come in, the mobility aspect, uh, which of course links in with the, with the bicycle, which you mentioned uh, yeah. just, uh, just now. Um, and in Nadeshiva's case, uh, I was really actually, I hadn't known about the flaneurs as a, as a figure in Russia, so that was really new to me. Uh, and I wonder whether she's an exception or whether there are others as well uh, whom we could bring in here. Sorry, that's lots of questions, but just no, okay. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I'll do I'll do them in order because the first two I am afraid I don't have a very satisfactory answer to. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think this idea of the director, the directors factoring in the female gaze, knowing that the audience is likely to be female dominated during the war years, that makes a lot of sense to me. I think the fact that one of the directors is um, married to one of the actresses, that's also a really interesting thing that would be difficult to untangle. But um, 
definitely seems to me instinctively like there's something in that. Um, my thesis window stops at 1913 um, deliberately to mm -hmm. because I feel like if I get into the war and the revolution, it's it's a can of worms from which I will never emerge. <laughs> um, but um, I have been thinking about pushing it further or perhaps including an epilogue, um, which maybe traces some of these changes. So that's that's something which I've written down that I will come back to. Um, the reason that I have hesitated so far to talk about cinema in Russia is because in France I have a female director. Um, so I have Alice Guy Blaché, Alice Guy at the time, um, and she's one of the first directors of early cinema and she makes narrative films which is still a novelty from the mid 1890s up until 1907 when she moves to America. Um, and I'm particularly interested in what women do with the camera and how they direct it rather than what men think they want to see and there's there you can argue about how close those things might be how how perceptive the the male directors are to what female audiences want to see um yeah that's i haven't thought about male directors in enough depth to to give you a better answer than that i'm afraid um the female tourist i would again like i would love to talk about her um I think you're right. I think that image does look like a steamship to me as well, or some kind of large ship. Um, I haven't thought about the female tourist. I would love to. I have limited it geographically to Paris and Petersburg, again, just for reasons of the doctoral thesis. But um, I'm going to file that one away for um, postdoctoral articles or postdoc ideas. Um, is Nijesheva an exception? Um, I think yes and no. I think she's exceptional in that she's published her visual impressions. Also, I think this is largely a fictional account. Um, I think that has to be said. Um, but in the sense that women were walking up and down Nevsky Prospect on a daily basis, not exceptional. Um, that feels like too short an answer for an important question, but I think the thing that makes her exceptional is that she published it in a structured way and I know there are other female journalists, but um, I've not yet found anyone whose text I can analyze in a similar way. Thank you. Thanks. Zafa, would you like to ask your questions, please? I'm afraid I can't hear you. Zafri, are you on mute or are you trying to speak and there's a problem? Because we, we, I don't think we can hear you ask the questions. I can scroll back. I can see your question in the chat. I can. We can do that. Do you, would you like me to read them out for you, Sasha? Would that help on, on behalf? No, it's fine. I can see them. They're right there. Okay, fine. Great. Um, so Zafra, give me a nod if this is the question you want me to answer. Um, how do you look at post-imperial Russian novels and promoting photography, new acquired skills empowered in Russia? Um, is that the one? Um, I haven't looked at novels yet. Um, there are some novels by Russian women around this time. Um, the Keys to Happiness is the one that everybody knows. Um, I could go through that um, and look for visual examples. At the moment, I haven't felt like I need to move to literature because I have a lot of real life examples. I mean, I've just said New Jeshiva is fictional, but um, she is talking about a real life place and a real life um, situation. Um, yeah, that's something I'll bear in mind is going to literary sources. I have been cautious of them elsewhere in my thesis. My first chapter in part deals with the department store in Paris and I've been so tempted to use Zola and I have resisted that temptation so far. Um, so I will, I will have a think about the potential to use literature as a source for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Daniel, would you like to ask your question, please? Yes, in a way you've um, almost answered it already with some of the previous questions. Um, I know nothing about St. Petersburg and I know nothing about the history of photography, but one of the things that 
has always struck, struck me, particularly St. Petersburg, a modern, sophisticated, beautiful city. I think it's had a couple of million people or whatever, Nevsky Prospect, then as now. Um, I just wondered how far, Sasha, you were surprised at your discoveries. Because it seems to me that when I think about the Europeanization of culture as a whole and railways and travel and all the great figures, Turgenev and so on, going back and forth, women, uh, certainly the sophisticated, educated, cultural ones, there were women mm -hmm. actors, uh, opera performers and so on. I would have guessed that they wouldn't be that different from sophisticated, cultured, women in Western cities as well. And they will probably have known some of them, some will have relationships with some of them. And therefore, you know, they might even have been wondering about things like, oh, I know the vote, um, the development of literacy, better schooling for the kids and so on. How far were you surprised by your results? As I, an ignoramus, listened to you and looked at the lovely images and so on, I thought, well, yes, I'd, I would have guessed this by this kind of period. Am I wrong or what? <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right in, in some respects. I've got conflicting influences, like there's an angel and a devil on my shoulders. And one of them is a, a scholarly discourse that says Russia is underdeveloped. Russia comes late to modernity. Um, so the all that is solid that turns into air, turns into air, the one of uh, the... Marshall Baumann, um, one of the defining texts about the, the experience of modernity, has a whole chapter on St. Petersburg called The Modernity of Underdevelopment. <laughs> um, so in, in certain categories, Russia is behind. As you say, um, I've been really pleasantly surprised by the extent of the transnational connections that I can trace. Um, a lot of Russian women, when they can't access higher education in Russia, go either to Switzerland or to France. So I've got a lot of Russian women studying medicine, studying law in Paris. Um, I have families who are um, half Russian, half French living in Paris, but who the parents met in Petersburg. Um, as you're, you're right, and part of, part of the choice of Paris and St. Petersburg came from my understanding of this transnational exchange. My master's thesis was on the Ballet Russe. Oh. Um, and the... I mean, Stravinsky is able to get on a train in St. Petersburg and arrive in Paris and everybody thinks that he is the bee's knees and the greatest thing. Mm. So I think there's, I think they're a lot closer than we like, than, than we have thought in the past. Um, am I surprised, there is a question about class in here. Um, am I surprised that elite cultured women who have access to this kind of thing take, take to it like ducks to water? No. Um, I think the thing which has surprised me is how widespread it is and just the the level of enthusiasm with which women seem to have taken to the, I'm not surprised that you can get a camera in Russia. That that doesn't surprise me. I am surprised by the enthusiasm with which the camera was met. Because that says something to me about there's something about the cultural climate in St. Petersburg, which is fertile ground for these commodities. And um yeah, one of the one of the points which I was really surprised by, because women's professionalization is not super advanced in Russia. Um, a thing that I was surprised by was to see that there are about 60 professional women photographers um, listed between 1839 and 1929, I think, like really quite large numbers of women who are making their living from this new technology. And I think I think that's interesting, just how quickly they get on the bandwagon and how, how they are at the cutting edge of that. So am I surprised? Yes and no. But thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Thank you. We, we've got about 10 minutes left in this part of the session and about four or five questions. So we'll, um, we'll endeavor to ask, uh, offer the opportunity for everyone to ask the question of Sasha. Um, Alison, would you like to ask your question now, please? Thank you very much. Yes. Um, this was just a, a follow up to Ruth's question, really, um, to ask, is, do you think there's any connection between Paris, Russia and the royal family, the Russian royal family moving between the two cities? 
in relation to photography? The Russian royal family. Um, I haven't looked into them too much. You might have recognized the last slide is actually Anastasia Romanov, um, Romanova. Um, so I was just imagining that they would be quite photographed people and whether they, are, and they photograph themselves a lot. Um, a lot of the online material that's available of photographs from this period come from the, the imperial family's albums. I have not looked at it yet. I am conscious that my doctoral project sort of is already heavily weighted towards middle and upper class women. And I thought that adding some more elites might just tip that balance over entirely. But um, yeah, that is a really good point. I wasn't actually aware that they moved back and forth between Paris. I knew about the English connection. I didn't know about the French one. The only reason I know about it, I'm an early modernist. I'm not a I'm, I know nothing about Russia apart from the fact that um, Labanoff had the letters of Mary Queen of Scots. <laughs> so <laughs> that's my one <laughs> sort of contribution. I'm sorry, I can't, I, I can't elaborate any further, but I assumed that they had moved backwards and forwards as a result. That I may be wrong. Quite possibly. I, I might look it up. I'm sure that the Imperial women have travel photographs um, in their albums. So that would combine quite a few of the things that have come up in the questions so far, if I can find that. Thank you for a great paper. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anthony, would you like to ask your question, please? Um, yeah, I was just wondering what the advent of technology had done to um, already present activities amongst both men and women, rather like slumming, did that kind of improve uh, the the idea of the the process of it, or did it increase the amount of women doing that activity? I have never read anything about slumming in the Russian context. Um, my understanding would be that um, for a woman to do it unaccompanied would be very ill-advised, um, irrespective of the technological um, material she had with her. Um, there are elite women who spend time on peasant, in, in peasant communities, on estates, um, rural. Um, but I think it is more of a rural urban divide. I haven't heard of elite urban women in Russia visiting um, like tenements or places where the lower classes were living in the cities. So I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the expertise to answer that, but it's an interesting idea. Okay. Emma, would you like to ask your question, Sasha, please? Thank you. Sure, thank you, Sasha. That was really, really very interesting. Um, so while we were, while you were talking and then while we were thinking in response to Hubertus's question about Yevgeny Bauer, I was thinking about the, the sort of dual, the dual ways in which, if you like, the, the sort of the ability of the capture to capture reality was sort of framed in early cinema, i.e. There, there are sort of two angles. One is the, you know, we can capture objective reality. This is a moving photograph with a sort of indexical relation, which allows us to understand the experience of modernity and consumption. And then the other is the kind of uncanny, um, mm. which is there in the history of photography from the beginning with the desire to photograph, um, you know, ectoplasms in the Victorian yeah. obsession with ectoplasms. And then Bauer's really preoccupied with the, the kind of instability, if you like, the capacity of the camera to, 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 to show things that are not real and cannot be trusted. And I was wondering if you have a sense yet of where the, I mean, of course it won't be as generalized as that, but if there's a sense of how, how your female photographers are kind of positioning their understanding of, the, of what the medium does. You know, mm -hmm. is it about kind of consumption and capturing urban experience or is it about destabilizing and uh, revealing a kind of uncertainty? <clears throat> Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, from what I've seen so far, it's most of the photography that is being proposed to women is family photography or and, and would therefore fall into the more documentary category. Um, I haven't I haven't seen and that that doesn't mean that it's not there. I haven't seen a lot of women, because this is happening at the same time as sort of like supernaturalism and I haven't seen it come through in images created by women yet. Um, 
uh, something which I did stumble across, which I thought was really interesting, was um, Gepius sort of steps outside of both of those, the, the supernatural, uncanny, slightly spooky, and the, the straight up factual documentary. And she says that cinema is so much more boring than real life, um, which I thought was interesting because it's sort of a third path. Um, and I am hoping to talk about women's reactions to cinema. I had just haven't quite got there yet in this chapter. Um, yeah, I tend to think it, it, it leans towards the side of documentary because most of it's about the family. Obviously there is the, the sort of Roland Barthes school of thought where even family photography is kind of spooky because the photograph contains the knowledge of death within the, within the heart of the home or something like it's, you can make it, you can make family photography spooky, but I haven't seen that in the images that I've been looking at so far. Unfortunately, I would love that. Thank you. Okay, and I think we've just got time for one last question. Questions we don't ask or aren't able to answer, I'm sure Sasha will respond to and we'll, we'll make a copy of them. Joseph, do you want to ask the last question of this session? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Um, yep. Sasha, thanks so much. I loved your paper and uh, found it um, extremely convincing and uh, the sources you use are, are really terrific. So thank you very much for it. Um, I had a question about the extent to which the female gaze in, in the period and places that you're studying could came at any point to stand in for the imagined uh, universal human gaze in the sense that the sort of extant critiques of the male gaze, um, one of the sort of key critiques seems to be that it's unconsciously taken to stand in for, you know, the universal kind of way of seeing things and that that's an, that's an error, but we don't see it. And so part of the critique is to expose that. And it struck me while listening to your observations on the um, amateur codicus that it's aimed at a, predominantly, it sounds like um, women readership. And so in a sense, there is this kind of strong articulation of a female gaze, but then it's being kind of recirculated within a presumably predominantly female um, group as it were of readers, right? Um, and so in that sense, there's little chance of that kind of gaze being elevated to the status of the normative gaze of how people see the world, right? Um, in the way that the male gaze so often is. Um, and I guess my question is, to what did it ever become, could the female gaze in this period ever become hegemonic or did the, well, not hegemonic, I suppose, but did the male gaze remain hegemonic um, on, in an uncomplicated way? Or do you, are you sort of challenging that notion by bringing women's looking into the picture? Yeah. Thank you. Um, your question reminds me of um, those studies they do of children's reading where men don't identify with a women narrator, but women are expected to identify with a male narrator. Um, so I'm just going to give a really quick, a quick answer so that we can move on to Lucy. But um, I don't think the female gaze becomes hegemonic. I think there are pockets where the male gaze becomes obsolete, if that makes sense. I don't think I don't think women become universal. I think there are circles. I think you see it also with painting. Um, I think there are women artists who paint other women um, where the male gaze is just kind of irrelevant. Um, that would be my, my gut reaction. That would be my sort of visceral sense of it is that there are pockets rather than the female gaze rising to the status of the default male gaze. I think that persists, but not quite everywhere. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sasha, and thank you all to everyone who's asked questions um, in this first part of the um, afternoon. Um, we'll move now to the second paper uh, of this afternoon's seminar by Lucy Clark. Uh, Lucy is a Scaludi Fellow at Jesus College, University of Oxford, where she's finishing her DPhil. Uh, she's an interdis interdisciplinary historian of early modern England, um, and her DPhil thesis is entitled Public Men on Public Stages. Uh, the performance of state authority by magistrates in popular drama 1590 to 1610. Lucy's thesis investigates popular reception of the state in early modern England through examining a series of plays staged in outdoor theatres in London. Her work hinges on a consideration of acts of government as performance where magistrates actions constituted the structure of the state in the minds of ordinary Englishmen and women. And this afternoon Lucy will be speaking on all and every person to keep silence, finding the audience in the early modern theater of the state. So thank you, Lucy, and over to you.
Okay, um, can everybody hear and see me all right? Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so let's see if my computer explodes. Um, can everybody see my slides now? Uh, okay, then. All right. Uh, so thank you very much everybody for um, for coming. Um, this presentation is based on work that started off as part of my DPhil and then sort of ballooned into something far greater than itself. Um, and so this is what I'm hoping to actually really work on when I finish the thesis. So um, as Philip said, my thesis is an investigation of the representation and really reception of the early modern state um, by looking at drama. Um, in the period from about 1590 to 1610. Um, so the, um, the vision of the state that I am thinking about specifically comes mostly from Michael Braddock. Uh, Michael Braddock's notion of kind of state formation relies on the idea that people practicing the state, so magistrates of varying stripes, colors, you name it, they make the state real when people see it. Um, and this is from a sort of general theme um, in, histori in historiography of early modern government for about the last uh, 20 years, really, um, about kind of reception, um, about reception and about um, interpretation. And so um, Braddock points out that normally compliance with political power does not result from the use of force, but from a recognition of the essential legitimacy of the action in hand. Um, and Hindle, Fox and Griffiths also point out that, you know, there's a need for not just to disseminate authority, there's also um, a level of reception and interpretation. Um, and while, you know, it's certainly worth noting that obedience saturates early modern culture, you know, you get it from the pulpit, uh, you get it in proclamations. Um, and Alison Wall points out the fact that obedience is a very much a hegemonic ideal. Um, I think it's also important for us to look closer and actually think about how obedience um, is created in those that um, interact with magistrates. Magistrates are, you know, they range from you know, high officials to say people like, you know, the Lord Chancellor, the Lord Chief Justice, and then it goes down to, um, through different levels. We have, you know, high sheriff of a county, who's JPs for smaller sections of a county, and then constables and watchmen in, you know, individual villages. Um, and what I'm interested in is these interactions when say a, a constable says, okay, I'm arresting you, you've done something wrong. And the person says, no, I don't want to be arrested. Because I think that moment's fascinating. And I think the moment as well when they say, yes, of course, okay, I'll go with you. I think that's interesting. Um, as Irving Goffman, the sociologist says, the fact that participants seem to have no trouble in quickly coming to the same apparent understanding in this matter, does not deny the intellectual importance of our trying to find out what this apparent consensus consists of and how it is established. And so I'm really interested in how it is that magistrates achieve compliance. It's important to remember that a magistrate in this time period that I'm looking at, at the end of the 16th century, early 17th century, they have very little force that they can rely upon. Often they're going to be outnumbered. By people in the street you know in the, the examples i've been looking at today often you have you know two or three magistrates facing crowds of 30 40 people and clearly there needs to be some work done by the magistrate to appear um, legitimate and so i am really interested in actually trying to go past just blanket assumptions about compliance and obedience and actually to try to consider the performance of this because fundamentally drama is drama that, you know, as we think of it, is a performance where it is embodied action that is being interpreted by an audience who put together some sort of, um, some sort of picture of what's going on. Um, oh, okay. Um, and so Braddock says um, in his really interesting article about state magic, uh, drawing from Bourdieu, um, he talks about the way that an office holder needs to define the nature of the encounter and manage others' impression of him. And if this was successful, the transaction would run smoothly. A magistrate needs to present himself as a magistrate. He needs to be legitimate in the eyes of the person he's trying to exert his authority upon. This is bipartite. On the one hand, he needs to successfully act like he is a magistrate. And on the other hand, he also needs to sort of disappear behind that part. The private man needs to vanish inside the public man. Um, and this, I think, is actually very similar to how people thought about acting. Acting in this period is understood as a sort of vanishing 
act. Um, and so uh, in Overbury's characters, we're told that an excellent actor does not strive to make nature monstrous. She is so often seen with him. What we see him personate, we think truly done before us. And so again, we see this sort of disappearing act. You have your private person, you know, Joe Bloggs of Woking, suddenly becomes Justice of the Peace for Surrey. We lose that, it, we're meant to lose that private person at the very least, sometimes we don't. Um, but the other thing is that in manifesting um, the state, this is also a performance that's going on. When a uh, magistrate successfully carries out their authority, they make concrete the structure of the state that has delegated power from them from the monarch in the end. And so this is this kind of two pronged way of thinking about performance. On the one hand, you've got to convince the person you're trying to get compliance from. But on the other hand, you need to be successful so that the state actually works in the way it's meant to. Um, and so I'm really wanting to get kind of deeper into these, these moments of performance, both performing the state into reality and performing as a magistrate. Um, and so Mary Thomas Crane, um, in a really interesting article from I think about 20 years ago now, um, she writes that performance involves both a physical reality of embodied enactment and a secondary level of representation that emerges from it. And this is the jumping off point for the way that I think about um, the interactions of magistrates and those they attempted to govern. There is the thing you see, but there is also the wider, the wider meaning of this. So historians have used the word theatre of state, theatre of politics, the performance of politics for quite some time. And it's as understandable as it is slightly frustrating to somebody who's trained as a literary scholar as much as a historian, um, because the, the terms do a lot of work. They, do, they convey the dynamic between a governor as some form, kind of performer. Um, they give this sense of maybe an audience and also the important um, idea of agentive action, yeah, of doing something specifically so that it represents something else. But historians quite understandably haven't necessarily thought about this in terms of dramatic performance or using the toolkit that early modern drama studies offer us. Um, and so actually, um, I think we can go deeper. And so Andy Woods um, perceptively points out that the market is a theater for the everyday performance of domination, subversion, confrontation and resistance. But what I want to see is actually, if, if this marketplace is a theater in at least one performance, one performer is presenting embodied action to be interpreted, what challenges does that performer find? And in this specific setting, are they different from in other settings? What is it that makes his performance satisfactory? How is it that he making a proclamation, for example, becomes legitimate? And what is it that makes it so satisfactory when the end point has to be successfully imposing authority? Um, and so this is really where my, um, my work at the moment is sitting and where I'm hoping to carry on with. Um, this is very much um, explorative work. Um, so, Basically, this came out of a practices of research workshop that I did in March. I had another two planned and then the world ended. Um, so unfortunately, I only had a, a chance to do one of three planned workshops, which slightly limits some of these findings. And I'd be very, very interested in, in any feedback. Um, but this is very much a, um, an opening to what I think will probably be a much, much larger um, project. Um, and so um, one of the things that I'm going to talk about is about the way that performance in, of all kinds, but also magisterial performance is inherently risky and precarious. Um, and so there is not such a case of, you know, a homogenous um, sense of obedience that always works. Sometimes it doesn't work. And in the records that I'll be talking about, often we see that just accept it, uh, just um, assuming there will be compliance is quite dangerous for a magistrate. Um, and Robin Chapman Stacey in her really brilliant book on law in, um, in early modern, sorry, early medieval Ireland as a form of performance, she points out the, the way that stakes of a performance really change kind of this risk. The fundamental question of a good performance is, do they do it well? Do you believe it? quite the same with an actor, it's also quite the same with a magistrate. If you're facing a crowd of you know, 500 rioters in 1549, and there's not that many of you, you probably want your performance of uh, the King's authority to be fairly successful. 
Um, but although that perhaps that's just me. Um, but the other thing that we need to think about is interpreting. And so Dennis Kennedy in his um, Spectator and the Spectacle book, he points out a fundamental problem of interpretation and subjectivity. Can a performer limit what a, what a audience member sees and understands? And what I will be presenting is that there was a tool or a set of related tools that magistrates could draw upon, uh, which I refer to as the authority of performance. So this is drawing on Goffman's um, idea of the frame. And this is a way that magistrates could convey a sense of legitimacy upon themselves and also separate themselves from those they attempted to govern. So just a quick outline. Um, so practice based research is something that lots of drama scholars are familiar with. There are more and more historians doing it. I've got some examples on this page and I would really recommend looking at all of them, particularly the medieval dance project, because it's just so much fun. In lockdown, this girl, she, I think she did 20 different medieval dances by herself. Um, it's it's fantastic. But what's really interesting in all of these examples is this is about experience. How do we experience things that happened in the past? Yes, I, there is no way that I, what I did in my workshops was definitively how things happened. But what they did offer was a new way of imagining how things happened, which is all we ever do when we're looking at texts. This is just a way of doing it physically. So what um, we did in this workshop back in March, this is an excerpt from a much, much longer document from Star Chamber. Um, so from the Star Chamber records of James I. And this is what we call a rescue. Um, and so uh, this is one of the best examples of getting a record of how somebody tried to arrest somebody else. Because a rescue is when it goes wrong and somebody else or often a group of people come in and say, nope, you're not being arrested and they carried them away and the magistrate usually ends up beaten up some sometimes even you know near death um and so what we did was we turned this into um a script for uh six or seven actors and we tried staging it with different kind of different moments with the actors with no direction from me uh with the actors just kind of trying to follow what they thought was happening and we tried as well with a violence uh, called a stage fighting coordinator to see just what it would look like um as well and so what this workshop allowed was both to think about the relationships between different parties on um in you know this open space of a street when an arrest went very badly wrong but also to think about what was done and how that presented the state structure um, and it was a very surprising workshop in that it told me way more than I ever expected. This was meant to be just sort of window dressing for something else. And then it became much, much bigger. Um, so um, this arrest, basically, a guy called Robert Webster, there's a warrant goes out for his arrest. And so uh, Giles Bateson, who is the uh, sheriff of the county of York, he goes out with uh, Richard Bustle and William Darrell. And they go, OK, we'll go and arrest him. But uh, Robert uh, Webster does not want to be arrested. And he has a bunch of people in the street who do not also want to see him arrested. Um, and in the end, it ends in a massive fight and a riot. And we'll get to some of the uh, slightly more amusing details um, as I go through this. Now, an arrest can be understood, I argue, as a moment where a magistrate attempts to change reality. I arrest you. That is a speech act. It does the work of you know, the actual thing that it's being said. If an arrest is successful, it means that that kind of reality has been changed. Yeah, the arrestee accepts it. Um, and so what should be noticed here is also um, that this is about perception. Um, and so McGavin and Walker in their really wonderful book on imagining spectatorship, they talk about authorizing and sponsoring public performances um, and about the ideas of kind of anticipating responses. And I think this is a really useful paradigm to apply to thinking about arrests, as we'll get through this section of my, of my paper, for thinking about how people present at the time might view what was being done. Um, in the workshop, one of the things that um, came up was actually trying to work out when the arrest had happened. 
And so when the arrest happens, and as this, you know, this is something I've seen in plenty of other records, generally the magistrate will turn up, say, are you X, Y, Z? I have a warrant here for your arrest to attach your body. You have the opportunity at that point to comply and just go with them. But plenty of people do resist. Now, the problem is that an arrest is conceptualized as an attaching of the body. And so it's a restraining of a man's free will, um, Lambert and Dalton, um, who are legal writers from the period talk about it. Um, and so there's this idea that the changing of reality is also at the point where you have, you actually have the, um, the arrestee in your possession. Um, and this, is, this was quite interesting during the workshop because at no point was it really clear when the state had stopped happening and had become real, at which point, the arrest had actually was done, a fait accompli. Um, and so lots and lots of records of arrests and these rescues, I've been through quite a few of them, not nearly enough yet um, because of the, the pandemic. Um, but one of the things that we see is um, a real emphasis um, in, in, inter in interrogatories um, that are um, put to people who have rescued criminals, where they refer to the arrestee being in the custody of the person, of the person doing the arrest. Um, so we've got being then and there in his custody, quietly in the custody, then in hold upon your majesty said writ of capias at legatum. And the second bullet point on this, this is from um, a rescue of a guy called Samuel Fairbank. And in the interrogatories, every single person accused of rescuing him said, well, I didn't know he'd been arrested. I'm actually not sure any arrests have taken place. And so it's not even that they're questioning, you know, whether or not it was okay for them to take the guy away. They actually say, no, arrest didn't happen. It's not real. Um, and this is, I think, really, really important to think about. But the other thing that became very, very clear um, in the workshop, among lots of other things that I wish I had time to talk about, um, was that the audience who are silent in many ways in the records of such things became much more present. Um, so I'm just going to, um, can everybody see this? this? Can somebody nod if they can see this, uh, this video that I've got up? Okay, so this is um, probably very poor quality, but this is just the beginning of the workshop. So we've got uh, Webster over here and we've got two of our magistrates over here and then a crowd. Are you Robert Webster? Yes. In the name of the king, we hold here writ of attachias for your arrest, in order to ensure you appear at his majesty's court of common pleas, to enter a bill commenced against you by Michael Asquith, one of the attorneys of the said court. In the name of the king, and in my authority, a spaineth of the wapentake of heart here in the county of York, sworn and known, I arrest you. I arrest and attach you according to the warrant. Well, well, we'll leave the fight. Um, but this is just a small excerpt of the workshop. But what we, what I noticed when this was happening was the fact that the people who were there at the arrest, the people who then came in to intervene, it wasn't that they just appeared out of nowhere. They were there the whole time. They are an unheard, silent audience that often in records of these sorts of things seem completely invisible. And this is something I found in lots of rescues where suddenly, there's a crowd that's been there this whole time. It's done in the street, it's done at the marketplace, but we just don't hear from them until they respond negatively. And so I think it's it's interesting that there is already an audience that a magistrate has to be aware of in these public spaces. Now, for an arrest to happen, obviously people around can't get involved. If you're one, two, three magistrates trying to arrest somebody, you definitely don't want you know the massed people of Whiten to come and get in your way. And so um, the audience needs to do nothing. But it's important that this for early modern viewers is often understood as an act of sanctioning. And so again, McGavin and Walker point out how Sir Thomas More said that attending Anne Boleyn's coronation would basically be tantamount to sanctioning it. If you allow it to continue, you are saying it is okay. And so what we see there is that the audience to this arrest has the power to say whether it is legitimate or not. Okay, 
So um, now the threat to magistrates is quite uh, potent at this point. On the one hand, the, um, the person being arrested might fight back. So Richard Tyler in 1605 in a place called Bosbury um, was so violent um, to his arresting officers that he ended up being put in stocks um, and then was rescued from the stocks later on. So it wasn't very successful in the end. Then uh, Constable Anthony Judkin uh, was stabbed um, so that he was, um, in such and so dangerous manner that he did hardly escape without great peril of his life. Notably, the writers of this, um, this bill of complaint for Star Chamber, they point out that this is in manifest contempt of the writ. The little piece of paper that says, I have the right to arrest you. I would love to talk about writs um, in questions. Can't really talk about them now because there's so much to be done with them. Um, but it's important that there is very clearly a bodily risk to people going out to, to make these arrests. And so of course it's important for them to try to uh, you know, create a sense of legality, of legitimacy. Um, and so Jonathan Healy um, has done some really interesting work um, on what he calls moments of government. He talks about a fray in uh, Weymouth in school, I think it's 1636, um, where a magistrate called Randall comes into a massive, massive fight and says, I am, I am the officer of the king, I demand that you stop. And what Healy does really interestingly here is that he, po he points out the way that Randall did this by invocation. He's raising himself, he's identifying himself as a representative of the crown. Um, and so this raises his actions above those of a petty vigilante. Now, um, this is where he thought, thinks about this as being a performative concept. The state can be performed into being. Um, but what I want to suggest is actually that we can take this a little bit further. Um, the idea of raising Randall's actions once again refers to interpretation. It refers to the implicit audience to the theatre of state that is always there and must always be managed. Um, and so if we use the vocabulary and toolkit of early modern drama studies and also some sociology, um, I think we can actually consider a really interesting um, tool that magistrates had. Um, at their disposal for dealing with their audience. Um, and so um, I call this the authority of performance. This is a, a state where the, um, or not state, situation, where the magistrate can actually present himself as the sole legitimate performer in front of a group of people and where he is the person that must be paid attention to. And this confers legitimacy upon him. Um, furthermore, I want to suggest that this is often a very precarious performance and that it has the opportunity to go wrong. It is a contingent um, frame that is often there to be challenged. Um, so um, Irving Goffman talks about um, his idea of the frame as being a way of kind of working out what you're meant to be doing as a way of identifying what situation you're in. And this is, I think, very useful. I think that a magistrate can assert a frame of legitimacy by establishing a boundary between himself and bystanders. Um, some of this certainly would have been established by the fact that somebody is a known representative of the state. If you live in a village and you know you're just the peace, that would probably do some of the work for you. However, I think we also need to think about um, moments like this arrest where this was the, just the high sheriff of the entire county, so may not have been so recognisable. Um, and he comes in, and as we saw in that workshop, the actor just gestured with his writ. None of that was directed, he had that, and there was the force of the writ. Um, it kind of adds to this illocutionary act of saying, I arrest you in the name of the king. Um, but also it's important that when he gestures with that writ, he draws all the attention of the audience onto himself. It centers the moment on the assertion of office. At that point, he is the only person that should be speaking and the only person that should be heard. Um, and because an arrest so depends on compliance and non-intervention, what we can see is that the, uh, the practice of the English state actually requires bystanders to be audiences, to stay and watch and listen because the dissemination of authority relies upon them accepting it. Um, and so in the situation of arrest, a magistrate very much needs to be a sole performer um, with no challenges to that performance and nobody else saying, what you are doing means something else. It means something that is illegitimate. There can be no contrary inter interpretations. Now, another important part of this is thinking about uh, public space. So Andy Wood points out just how important public space and controlling it is for popular politics. 
But what I want to suggest is another way of thinking about these moments where a magistrate is in a public space, like the street, sometimes in pubs, but a couple of those I've found, um, when they've got people around. I think we can use um, some tools that have been used by drama specialists um, to think about that assertion of authority and legitimacy. So uh, Robert Wyman, um, or Wyman, never sure, um, his idea of theatrical authority, it depends on this idea of locus and platea. Locus is the space, um, kind of the, um, the center of the stage, and it's a raised platform, which is where characters with authority would speak. And the platea is the edges of the stage. So this is where there's more interactivity. Um, and as Erica Lynn kind of points out in her interesting reading of this theory, there is an invisible line between um, actors from spectators. Person doing the thing, person watching. We see this again with that workshop. It was very clear who was doing things and who wasn't. Um, but Erica Lynn does something quite interesting in reconceptualizing Locus and Plataea. She actually thinks about this in um, slightly different terms and suggests that actually, the fundamental thing that defines theatrical authority on the stage is whether you're being watched and heard or not. Dramatic authority, i.e. the people that have authority in a scene, often clowns, jesters, fools, that's quite different. But if we think about the characters with authority, magistrates, kings, you name them, they are in the locus because they are being watched and heard and paid attention to. And I want to suggest that this is something we very much see um, in this rescue. When watching this, um, it was really fascinating, actually, to see this myself, because the first time we did it, every single person that was not playing Webster watched the magistrate actors so, so carefully. Even I felt myself thinking, oh, yes, there's such a clear definition between them, between those who are doing and those who are not, those who are being watched and those who are not. Um, and that's where this whole thing um, came from. The audience were not involved because they were being observers. They were sanctioning observers. Um, and this is what I think of as the authority of performance. Um, briefly, I would love to talk about this in questions. Um, I can't talk about it more fully, but um, some of the work I've been doing on proclamations, I think, also um, relates to this in that. Um, so John Walter talks about formal gesture acknowledgement to um, things like proclamations where you um, you sort of bow to the absent presence of the monarch. But actually, what I'd like to suggest is that this is a moment of um, accepting that you are an audience. And so these two bottom quotations, um, these are from two fake proclamations from libels, which um, I was very grateful to Claire Egan. And I think, I think you're in the audience, Claire, so thank you, um, who sent me these from, uh, from Star Chamber. And this is uh, where a couple of people or a group of people pay a vagrant to make a libelous proclamation about somebody they don't like. And what they do, um, interestingly, is they have this person mimic the form. So they, you know, they make an oh yes once, twice or thrice in such a manner as is used upon the publishing of one of your majesty's proclamations, whereupon, and this is the important bit, a great number of the market people then and there presently gathered themselves together, expecting to hear what should be there proclaimed. There is a response, a learned response here. We can think about this in terms of Goffman's idea of the frame. You know, we, we know what the situation is here. Okay, there's a proclamation happening. I'm going to go and listen. But it's important as well that they have made this gesture of submission to listen and to come together, to be the only people, um, the only people that can speak are the people that giving the, the proclamation. Again, I really wish I could go into more detail about this, but there just isn't time. Um, but I think this is also a really interesting way of thinking about the performative skills that a magistrate really, or a proclaimer in this um, instance needs to use. Now, the frame is not secure fundamentally. So um, with that rescue we staged, things go quite badly wrong um, for the magistrates involved. Um, the people around the place, they uh, in the in the crowd, they don't want uh, Webster to be arrested. Um, bystanders come in and say, this is unlawful, this is unjust. I've seen this in several different rescues. And what we see here is a moment of drawing focus, where people in the crowd say, actually, no, I am not letting you be the only person to speak. I come in and I'm saying, I interpret this differently, you're wrong. This is illegitimate, you're misusing the law. 
Um, and this is often seen as a, as a way of controlling space as well. So um, a guy called Sal Keld um, gets, or is meant to be arrested, demands that he can have the writ to read it. The magistrate is foolish enough to hand it over to him. He reads it and he trifles the time and perusal until his friends are around him. And then his friends close ranks. He pockets the warrant and says, what warrant? What are you going to do? because the, the control of space has been completely uh, destroyed. There's no longer a boundary between the magistrate and everybody else. They're all there. Um, and this very much happens in this, uh, this Webster arrest. And so Wilberfoss, who, was a, who actually was a local constable but didn't want to get involved, he, um, after beating up the, the three magistrates along with a massive crowd, he demands of, of the, uh, the sheriff, where now is the warrant? He bends down and yanks out some of his beard and says, look, everybody, here's the warrant. And what was fascinating about this in, in workshop was actually just seeing one, the way that the previously watchful crowd suddenly had invaded the space where we should have seen a performance of the state and its authority being delegated. Um, but also the way that um, another member of the crowd could control the space of performance by appealing to an audience, even with, you know, not actually, obviously we didn't, you know, de-beard any poor undergrad, um, but even just that moment of, look, I've pulled out his beard and this is, this is all they've got. The people in the room all laughed because it just seemed such a ridiculous moment. And so what we were left with is Webster being passed into the hands of the crowd the actors playing the magistrates unable to retain their grip upon him. And so even though this is staged violence as opposed to actual force, what was really clear is that magisterial authority was, had become fragile because of a hostile crowd. The real record of that successful arrest, which would be Webster's body remaining in the hands of those magistrates, was gone. And so what we were left with is a, a vision of the state where a hostile community and a hostile audience can completely overcome the authority of the state. Um, and I just want to leave you with this final thing. This is from the guy who nicked the writ. Um, it's important that when he, um, he, when he sent to Star Chamber for this, it is pointed out that this is a problem of potentially getting other people to do this, that this is something being watched by others and that this could lead um, to further tumult and uproar and so the stakes of the performance are extremely high. Um, and yeah, that's where I, I'll, I'll leave it there. That, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much indeed for that um, wonderful and incredibly rich uh, paper that um, took us both into a very particular moment, but, but brought so many different dimensions to it involving performance study and, and different ways of looking at a particular encounter. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, it's time now for questions for Lucy. Um, again, you're very welcome to add them to the chat, or if it's simpler, just um, raise a hand via Zoom and we'll call on you. So over to, uh, over to the audience for questions to Lucy. Christopher, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks very much, Lucy. So uh, I'm wondering how you deal with the issue that um, in many ways, a lot of what you've talked about is the singular magistrate. Mm -hmm. And the state, the performance of state in the provinces is very rarely the performance of a singular magistrate. Mm -hmm. And it's very rarely the performance not only of a singular magistrate, but one who is perhaps unknown as an agent of the state. So if we think about major performances, such as proclamations, which you mentioned, or other things um, like parliamentary writs, for example, in the calling of a parliament, then what we have are multiple authorities and multiple performances. They are often accompanied by music in some way or noise, such as the banging of a drum or trumpets or something like that. They are also performances based upon clothing. Uh, so we have the, you know, the red robe scarlet or scarlet alderman coming through town. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how those different elements sort of 
alter your overall narrative? Um, because you're talking about arrests, which is one performance of the state. Uh, but there are many other performances of state that work in a perhaps slightly different manner than what you've talked about. Yeah, sure. Thank you. It's a really interesting question. So um, I'm, I haven't had a chance to think about the parliamentary um, side of things yet. It's just not something that really fits into my thesis. And uh, it's something I do want to think about in the future. Um, in terms of proclamation, in fact, let me break this down. So if we think about um, numbers, yes, in lots of these examples, there are multiple magistrates there. But again, I think this is why the locus and platea idea is really useful, because if we think about borders and boundary conditions that are drawn between people acting and people not, and often what it seems in the, in the records that I've looked at is you've got often a magistrate who might not be recognizable to locals. So you've got your high sheriffs, people who've come from, you know, for whop and takes over or whatever. But then you also sometimes have recognizable officials. Sometimes though you don't. And I think that this is why it's often important for magistrates to convey themselves in this way. They need to show themselves that they should not be interrupted, that they should be given the audience they need. And I think with proclamations, this is something we see as well. So um, I've looked a bit at proclamations of peace. Um, and one of the things that they always focus on um, is about this making of silence. Again, there might be a group of them. And I think this is really important, the fact that there is this learned response of listening, you must go quiet, um, but it, re it remains, um, oh, sorry, something just fell off my desk. Um, it remains contingent, because if you think about the proclamation of peace, you have the, you have the OEAs for silence, then there's the reading of the writ, then there's usually three more OEAs. So there seems to be an implication that you can lose people's attention and that people might actually suddenly start to say, okay, now I'm, I'm bored now, I'm, I'm not doing this. Um, and so I think there is a sense that things continue um, and that the moment of government sometimes is longer and sometimes is, is shorter. Um, I think as well with um, things like proclamations, like of the new monarch, when we have sounds, um, we have music, people, um, I mean, I drew very much on your article about, uh, about proclamations in um, HLQ from a few years back and thinking about where people turn you know, four times to all the cardinal compass points and they blow a trumpet. Again, there's an emphasis there on listening and making sure that they are the person that draws attention. So I think a lot of this does come down to attention. From there though, I think there's also a secondary point, which is not something I had time to talk about and it's not something I've really done enough work on yet. Um, but there's a secondary point of persuasion, I think with some of these moments. First off, you've got to actually say, look, I'm the magistrate, fine, you believe me. But then there's a secondary moment. So when we think about, say, riot calming, um, you have a moment, say, in 1595 on Tower Hill, uh, where the, uh, the Lord Mayor is making proclamations of peace and nobody cares, nobody listens. And so because he has been able to assert that frame where he is being listened to, nothing else but force will work. Um, so I think that, yes, there are differences. And I think the things about costume as well are really interesting because there's also that layer of, um, authority that those add um, when we think about say the Lord Mayor's shows I think essentially there's a shifting spectrum of these different kinds of um, performances of authority that um, all work in different ways but I think they have this sort of common nugget um, I need a better word than nugget um, at the heart of them about this trying to get attention and trying to remain the people that you should be watching and the people that are the only ones that should be acting in the sense of doing things, not performing. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'm just gonna have a very brief follow-up. So mm. I, you know, cause I'm finishing a book on proclamations at the moment, mm. but I have a feeling that the idea of, of grabbing attention is obviously correct and this is how they do it. But I think apart from major events, most proclamations are proclaimed with a background noise and that I do not believe that the market stops operating completely for the pronunciation of what is often a quite lengthy proclamation and we can see evidence of on some occasions of it having to be repeated at the back of the crowd with an additional crier because there's so much background noise going on so I think that's just something to think about as well as to whether this does engender silence mm -hmm. or not. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things that I've been working on in the chapter that I'm writing at the moment is looking at the proclamation of peace in 
Henry VI part one, um, where there's a riot, uh, well, a tumult between two elite factions, retinues, um, and the Lord Mayor of London comes on stage and he goes, please stop, this is ridiculous. Um, and they don't, but when he makes a proclamation of peace, it does stop. But what I've discovered in workshopping is that it's actually a lot more complicated because often the people on stage, the actors themselves couldn't hear that proclamation, which I think raises really interesting questions about this performance. And fundamentally in a situation where things are, um, are busy um, at the market, I think it, it, it's a useful way of thinking actually about this attention grabbing in the same way that in the theater, you've got somebody in your ear saying, hey, do you want some oysters? And somebody over there who's having a fight with a, you know, a courtesan. So I think actually these, um, relations and difficulties with attention and gaining attention, I think are really useful to think about. So that's um, that's really helpful, thank you. Great. Um, Colin, would you like to ask your question now? Yes. Uh, I, Lucy, I've uh, learned so much from that. That was extremely interesting. And the way you synthesized different um, disciplines was uh, particularly interesting to me as a completely ignorant 20th century historian. And uh, please do take this question in that uh, vein as uh, somebody from an ignorant 20th century historian. Um, I wondered firstly about um, where you saw your research in relation to the literature on punishment in the early modern period, uh, because again, from a very ignorant place. I know that theatre and drama and performance is, is very central part of that. And your emphasis on reception and the fragility of that performance, I thought would be particularly interesting there. But also maybe punishment as a technique by actors of the state to deleverage, to de-risk the situation, um, I thought might be interesting to, to think about. And then I wondered um, uh, about the relation between your research and intellectual history, because when you presented a lot of that um, his historiography, which was really useful, a lot of it seemed to be um, social history broadly defined, maybe political history with a social bent. But when I think of the early modern period in intellectual history, I think of course of the Cambridge School of Quentin Skinner and that work on, on um, the birth of what they call the modern state. And I think that's relevant to your project in two ways. Firstly, um, they obsess about Hobbes, and Hobbes uh, imagines the state as embodied, as, as an artificial man, and I thought that might be interesting. But secondly, it, and this kind of pushes against that, it's a heavily textual um, historiographical approach, extremely textual. So I wondered whether your um, use of performance and embodiment speaks to, or perhaps critiques, a very influential strand of intellectual history that um, influences historians um, in centuries far beyond the early modern period. But thank you, very enjoyed that. Thank you. So um, the um, the punishment um, thing, I think, is interesting. Yes, I think punishment is something that lots and lots of people have talked about in, in reference to the state and the theatre of state. Um, and I think it is something that um, is important in the sense of there being exemplary punishment and it being used to create a message. But um, Susan Amerson has pointed out um, quite rightly that you can't control a spectacle and how it's interpreted all the time. There are people that you know end up feeling sympathy. I can't remember the exact, exact example she uses, but we have moments where people say, hang on, that's ridiculous. They shouldn't have been um, punished in this way. And it's actually a moment that is quite destabilizing for kind of consensus. Um, and then in terms of kind of punishments that I've encountered, one of the things that is interesting is that um, I was looking a bit at the Midlands rising in 1607 and how, um, again, this is something that's not fitting into my thesis anymore um, because it doesn't really come into the plays enough, but there is a really interesting dynamic I found between the idea of persuasive rhetoric and being able to persuade a crowd, a hostile crowd, or whether you should just go off and use force. And so James in his communications to the people dealing with the Mid Midlands Rising, he is very much interested in saying, stop trying to persuade them, it's not going to work. Which I'm fascinated by, this kind of dynamic between persuasion and punishment and violence. And I'm thinking about that at the moment with reference to Sir Thomas More, um, which obviously is never performed. Um, but that is a play where persuasion is shown to work without any need for violence. Whereas in the 1590s, you've just had 
a bunch of riots where the only thing you could do was violence. So I think that's interesting. Um, in terms of your kind of more uh, methodological question, um, I think I was very much influenced by the Cambridge School when I, because I, I was a history and English undergrad. So of course I, I, I was obsessed with Quentin Skinner when I was an undergrad. Um, and I think the textual um, basis of this is really important. Um, but what I think uh, Michael Braddock and some of these social historians, and Braddock's not just a social historian, Braddock's also dealing with this intellectual world of the state. He, I think he identifies four or five different states that are manifested by different kinds of magisterial practice. And actually that's the kind of point where I see myself um, intersecting with all of this. I think it is important that we do consider how government happens and how it is seen and understood but I also think it's important that we don't just think about that in terms of what is said. We also have to think about what is done. Um, and what I found, again, which I wasn't expecting to find from that, that workshop, um, is just seeing the relationship between different actors in the sense of people doing things on stage, uh, on stage, I've got too stuck in my thesis, um, in a public place and how they actually respond and relate to one another and thinking about kind of the proxemics of um, government practice is something that is something that doesn't always get addressed, I think, by the more textual based approach of the Cambridge School. Uh, so I hope that uh, example um, answers your question. Thank you. Um, Lorna, can we come to you now, please? Oh, thanks. Um, thanks, Lucy. That was uh, really fascinating. I loved your idea of the audience as um, sort of sanctioning performers. I like the bringing of the second person in there. Um, I think I'd just like to put a little pressure. I mean, you, you're talking about literature mainly in terms of performance theater, theory. And I'd just like to sort of bring the idea of fiction making in um, and put a little pressure on the Locus and Pla Plataea um, interpretation. I don't know the glossing by someone called Lynn, was it, of, of the Weimann that you talked about. Um, but in my understanding, the sort of locus and platea distinction is um, one involving um, orientation of utterance so that when you're in the locus, you're in a fictional space and character speaks to character. Whereas when you're in the platea, you're in the audience world and, and, and you interact. So um, it seemed to me that in your account, the locus was a more intense platea where you're still oriented, or, or do you see it as, as, as sort of, in a sense, participating in the fiction of authority? So that's one, one question. And then the other question would be, um, there are so many performance, there are so many uh, fictions of um, resistance of arrest and, um, critique of magisterial authority in, for example, Johnson's plays, for example, Haggis and Bristle in Bartholomew Fair, trying to put people in the stocks and saying, should they use their magisterial discretion? And we all know that constables don't have discretion, things like that. So I'm just wondering how that's the, or, or, or Bobadil in Every Man in His Humour, sort of, um, uh, you know, the way that they appeal to magistrates to sort of, uh, to actually arrest them sometimes and, and they won't do it. So I was just wondering about those two things. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, there's a cat that is just crawling on my feet. I need to get him up, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Oh, showstopper. Um, so the uh, the thing about um, the Locus and Platea, yes, so the idea of kind of the fictional um, world and where people are interacting with the fiction is something that, has kind of been occurring to me when I've been thinking about these moments in plays. Um, and I think the way that Lynn conceptualizes that I think is really useful because there is this sense of something that is being represented outwards. And those people in the locus, um, those magistrates, they obviously aren't going to be the people that are pointing at it saying, well, look at the look at the artificiality of this. They're not going to be the ones that have that interactivity. That's kind of how I'm thinking of it uh, more, but this is really useful for thinking actually about um, conceptually clarifying the terms. So thank you for that question. It really made me think. Um, then with uh, these fictions of resistance to arrest, I think it's, it's something that's, um, occurred to me quite a few times because in most of the plays that I've been looking at I'm about to start looking at um uh, what's it called uh the fall of Robert Earl of Huntington 
where there is an arrest and it is resisted because it is clearly an illegitimate arrest. Um, and what I'm uh, kind of fascinated by there is this moment mm. of, um, it's what Holger Slime calls it embodied mimesis, I think. Mm. Um, mm. This idea that you stand in for the person of the, the well, the king in that play. Um, and you say, look, I have the authority to do this to you and whether or not you believe it is interesting. Sorry, there's another cat chewing tinsel. I'm so sorry. Archie, come on, man. Sorry. Um, yes, yes, they are. Um, the the thing about um, lost my train of thought now. Yeah, resisting arrest, I think, is is used quite interestingly um, in these um, in the plays that I've looked at, and also in those city comedies, as actually questioning the authority of the person there. That's the the main place you see it which is interesting given that so many of these rescues, the writ, obviously they're very, uh, very, not writ, sorry, bill of complaint, they're very formulaic and they always go on in contempt of your majesty's laws, in contempt of the writ, ignoring and showing absolute, you know, disrespect to the writ of your good Lord King, etc. So I think it's interesting that there's a legal fiction of mm. um, disrespect, of act actively not complying as being a problem. And then, we actually have something quite the reverse in the in the plays where we actually see that these are moments where we expose illegitimate action. Um, so that's that's really fascinating. So I'm definitely going to think about that next time I read um, uh, more of my Johnson. So thank you for that, Lorna. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, sure. Yes, Johnson's full of it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, Claire, would you like to ask your question, please? Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Lucy. That was really fascinating. Um, I, I think especially the silence of the audience as a scent, I think that's a really important thing to think about. And I wondered if I could pick up on um, something you said about the magistrate performing a public man and the, the private man vanishing or, or the fiction being that we should assume that the private man vanishes. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you have any thoughts on turning that around. So then is the assenting audience um, performing the private kind of status? And if they challenge that figure, are they then kind of crossing that boundary into taking a public role? And that might be why it's so kind of threatening and, and problematic. And I wonder if that the, the public figure performance is only kind of effective in relation to the kind of private person assenting. Um, and I'm thinking about this probably, as you know, from my, my kind of ideas on libel as being, you know, criminalizing private, um, private insults um, at, the, at this particular point in time. But I wonder about the relationship between that private public dynamic mm -hmm. as an official status when these things are being performed? I think that's a, a really fascinating question. And actually it makes me think of how, um, considering things like a, a phrase, when a phrase happened, this is where we often find in, in the legal handbooks, people um, kind of pushing at, what does a private man do in this situation? Do they step up to act publicly? Do they get involved? Can a private man step in? Can a private man hurt other people? Um, so I think it is actually, it certainly could be seen as a stay in your, stay in your private person box. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed about quite a few of these arrests that go so badly wrong is that the people that come in to help have great local standing. Um, you know, they're popular. One of them, uh, one of them was a, um, an alehouse owner. So, I mean, I guess probably would be quite popular. Um, and that often seems to kind of make it much harder for the magistrates, because, you know, if you have a magistrate who is unknown in that area and it's just like, look, I got a writ, it's fine. But everybody else there is saying, well, I don't really care. I think that's a really important kind of um, network of assumptions that also needs to be laid over this. So that, sorry, I don't think I've answered that question very well, but I think it's a really fascinating point that I'm definitely going to think about more. Yeah, no, thank you. You have, that's, that's really interesting. Okay, um, in our last five minutes, I'm going to draw on the people that with lots of questions, draw on the people who haven't spoken yet. So if I could ask Jonah to ask his question, that would be great. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for a really brilliant paper. I think um, your uh, use of literary kinds of analysis for this kind of material is really, really helpful um, in thinking about it. And I have loads and loads of questions, but maybe I'll email you. Um, but I just wanted to ask 
primarily about um, this idea of the silent audience and how that might fit with work that suggests that a lot of arrests in this period were carried out without any magistrate or officer present mm -hmm. and that there was a kind of broad legal obligation on private persons um, to arrest people who are kind of committing flagrant breaches of the law. Yeah, I think I think this is a really interesting way of thinking about that dynamic between those watching and those not, or those watching and not getting involved and those watching and saying no. I think it's important that there is an assumption there about watching and judging if something is legitimate. So people have to exercise their own dis discretion, I guess, about judging things. And that's something that's that's something that I guess is really suffused through early modern culture. Um, if we um, if we think about the way that people are expected to dob in their neighbours um, for things, and there is a certain sense of okay, well, your husband is beating beating you, but I can't really get involved until you know you're nearly dead. So there's always these levels of kind of I'm, I know something is happening, but I've got to decide if this is all right. So I think that's a really interesting uh, part of this. Um, and I think, again, what we'll see with those, I haven't looked at any records of these, um, but I'd definitely love to talk to you about this more over email, um, is when we have people stepping in, they are obviously casting themselves in that role, which normally they do not hold. And so I think it's interesting to think about the dynamic between the audience and the, that performer what is it that actually generates the, legis the legitimacy of that performance? Some of that will have to do obviously with social relationships um, and, and you know, where people stand in relation to the rest of the people there. But also I wonder about the use of rhetoric by the person, you know, is it enough to do what Healy says, to raise your actions by saying, I'm doing this in the King's name. Um, so I think it raises some really interesting questions about what actually does raise that and does it just become a question of I've got bigger arms than you so I can pull him away quicker? I think it's it's a really, really interesting question. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And um, finally, um, let's go to Joe. Um, if we haven't asked your question, we'll, we'll certainly pass them on through the chat to, um, to Lucy. But Joe, do you want to ask the final question for the last couple of minutes? You mean me, uh, Philip? <clears throat> okay. Um, thanks, Lucy. Really amazing paper. Thank you. Really interesting. I learned a lot. I'm not obviously a, at all a specialist of this. So um, I appreciated um, your um, deft analysis of sources and also the the live action element, which is really cool. Um, I, I had a question about legitimacy because it seems to be like one of the key kind of analytical um, tools for you. Um, uh, and I, I found your analysis overall very persuasive. Um, but one thing that I was unsure about was the leap you make between the idea of the legitimate magistrate and the idea of the and the state as a legitimate agent. Um, and I think in, the, in your concluding remarks, you kind of made a, an elision almost like a connecting thing where if the arrest goes wrong, that calls the legitimacy of the state into question. I don't think you said it quite as bluntly as that, but that was sort of the way in which you framed it, I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong. But it, it seems to me that even when the arrests go wrong, that it's possible that that can still reinforce the, legit, the legitimacy of the state within the performance of the, of the arrest. Where in, and by this, I'm, I guess I'm suggesting a situation where say the crowd steps in to rescue the arrest, arrested person or the person who, who's attempted to be arrested. And in so doing, they're forced to articulate the terms under which a, an arrest would have been legitimate. So they're, they're forced to say, this is what an, a legitimate arrest would have looked like, looked like. And these are the terms under which we would accept you to remove one of the people from our community and put them in prison and subject them to trial, et cetera. And in that sense, even when the arrests go wrong to use your terminology, like that can somehow by a kind of backwards way end up reinforcing the state. It sort of seems almost Foucauldian, right? Where like, it's that relationality of the, authority of the author, the, per, the person of, you know, the, the officer of the state and the community that allows even those kind of failed performances to still become reinforced. I'm just wondering what you think about that. So I think I, I, think I would dis disagree. I'm not sure I entirely buy the Foucauldian interpretation of this. And I think it's actually a bit more complex. And I think fundamentally the way that people consider I mean at least in terms of the legal fictions that are written about these moments it is always understood as a massive threat um, 
And there's another example that just kind of springs to mind. Andy Wood um, talks about where uh, the um, 1549 rebellions, I can't remember which one, there's a crowd of people that a herald tries to talk to. And in the middle of it, a young boy uh, stands up, pulls his trousers down and moons the, um, the herald. Um, and then in the end, that kid gets killed by the soldiers that are accompanying the herald. Um, I think it is important that there are stakes to this that are harder for us to understand. Now, I think the problem is with popular um, legal knowledge and popular legal awareness, people saying this is illegitimate is going to have a lot more force, I think, than it would do for you know us now. I mean, even now, there is a, a certainly... Um, you know, not to put on my, this is a why I'm relevant today hat, but if we think about the questions we ask ourselves now about the legitimacy of, uh, of the operations of the police all over the world, every time there is a challenge, it raises more questions, I think, than it answers. And I think with this, this culture that is saturated in ideas about rights, um, about legal rights in particular, and about the way things should be done, even if a response to a an arrest is what we would perceive of as being legitimate say it is a bad arrest i think it still it undermines the state that wants to be uh, presented there's a reason these cases go to star chamber they are felt to be massive massive breaches um and the extent to which you know we can read this into people understanding i think this is where we think about the state on the local level because these are magistrates, these are the people that you see, you don't, you're not going to see the Privy Council and you're not going to see, you know, the Lord Chief Justice or whoever, but you are going to see, you know, your Giles Bates and occasionally, you're definitely going to see your, your Darrell and Bustle because they're local small town magistrates. But if you see them being unable to do it, if you see them being unable to get, sorry, there's another cat, Bean, every Christmas present, leave that alone. Sorry. Um, I think the problem is that, much as this cat is making a fool of me, um, if you make a fool of a, a magistrate that hasn't got the force to deal with people, if you see that they can't do it, they can't arrest people, it's actually going to completely erode that, um, that sense of um, legitimacy and also that sense, sense of capability, really, to be able to handle things. Um, if that, I think hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, it definitely does, thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Well, we're now at four o'clock, so we'll, we'll close there. Um, just before we finish, I've got um, four very brisk things to do. First of which is to um, thank Archie and B for their performances. Um, they were excellent. If they'd like to apply next year for fellowships, we encourage that. That's great. Um, secondly, to thank all of you, the audience, for attending and for asking such interesting questions and making the event go so well. Um, also to remind you that on the 9th of December, so a week today, um, starting at two o'clock, we've got the last in this terms uh, series, which is taking us to post-war France and post-colonial Mali with papers by two more early career fellows here at the Institute, Alexandra Steinleit, who's a past and present fellow, and Joe Gaisley, who's a Skaludi fellow at the University of Edinburgh. So if you're available two o'clock on the 9th of December uh, for the final session, and then finally, before we uh, finish, I'd just like to encourage all of you to turn off your mute um, and to join me in thanking um, Sasha and Lucy properly for two really stimulating and interesting uh, papers, both of which played on the question of spectatorship and performance in some very interesting ways. So if you'd like to join me in applauding uh, audibly, uh, Lucy and Sasha to finish. Thank you very much. Thank you.